Hello, everyone. Welcome. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Courts and Community Committee of the King County Superior Court. In celebration of Native American Heritage Month, we are presenting The Bench is for All. This presentation will celebrate an inclusive judiciary and serve as an introduction to the process of seeking a judgeship. My name is Averill Rothra. I serve the people of King County as a Superior Court judge. We are so pleased to have you with us today. Thank you for being here. We have a wonderful lineup of guests who will spend time with us today. Again, in celebration of Native American Heritage Month, the National Congress of American Indians has this to say about this special month. This month is a time to celebrate rich and diverse cultures, traditions, and histories, and to acknowledge the important contributions of Native people. Heritage Month is also an opportune time to educate the general public about tribes, to raise a general awareness about the unique challenges Native people have faced both historically and in the present, and the ways in which tribal citizens have worked to conquer these challenges. So before we move into our presentation, I would like to invite Beth Freeman to offer a land acknowledgement. Ms. Freeman is the Judicial Services Manager for the Department of Judicial Administration for King County. Ms. Freeman. As we begin our event, we respectfully acknowledge that our virtual gathering today is taking place on the homelands of Indigenous peoples, who continue to steward these lands and waters. We recognize tribal nations and organizations who actively create, shape, and contribute to our thriving community in King County and the state of Washington. We as a community are committed to engaging with and amplifying the voices of Native peoples and tribes and all members of our community. We strive to join with Native peoples and all members of our community to serve each other and the cause of justice. Thank you so much, Ms. Freeman. So we have three segments for our presentation today and hopefully followed by a Q&A at the end. We will have an opportunity first to explore the gubernatorial appointment process, meaning appointments of judgeships that the governor of our state makes. Next, we will talk about the judicial ratings process. Minority bar associations throughout the state, in addition to the King County Bar Association and the Washington State Bar Association and other bar associations and legal groups, often will offer a ratings process for judicial candidates. So we will learn about that. And to conclude our afternoon, we will hear from attorney Lauren King. She was confirmed last month to the position of judge to the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington. So let's get started with the Washington State appointment process. Governor Inslee works with focused and practice staff on judicial appointments, and that includes Deputy General Counsel Tip Wanhoff. Mr. Wanhoff graduated from the UW School of Law in 2011, and he has worked in the office of the governor for nearly eight years, where he's intimately involved in the appointment process. And he is teaming with our own Judge Jason Poitras, who was appointed to the King County Superior Court this year. So I am going to hand it off to Mr. Wanhoff and Judge Poitras. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Judge Rothrock, for having me. And uh, I assume that if, if you've tuned in today, you've at least thought about a career in the judiciary. Um, it is the goal of the governor to have a judiciary as diverse as the communities that it serves. So I'm excited that you are tuning in uh, this afternoon. My goal is to walk you through the steps of the state uh, state court judicial appointment process, and then I'll turn it over to Judge Poitras, who will share his experience going through this appointment process. So, so here's how it works. So the governor's office will get a notice of a vacancy on a court, like, like the King County Superior Court. Um, this most often happens when a judge might be retiring early from her or his term of office. So the governor's office will post a recruitment on the website, on our website, and notice, uh, notify the state and local bar associations that there is a vacancy that we're recruiting for. We invite any interested candidates to apply 
and the application questionnaire is already posted online on the governor's website. So if you're interested, you can log on to the governor's website and pull it up right now to take a look at it. It's a, it's a pretty uh, hefty uh, application. So we definitely encourage you to give yourself plenty of time to, to think about how you wanna to respond to the prompts on the questionnaire, but it's available right now. You can go and pull it up. Um, if you do choose to apply, uh, the governor's office of general counsel will interview you. So if you apply, you're guaranteed an interview with the governor's legal team. These days, these 30 minute interviews are conducted remotely via Microsoft Teams. And our goal is just to have a nice conversation where we can get to know you as an applicant. We do ask all applicants as part of this process to pursue judicial evaluations from local and minority bar associations. And I know that that's gonna be a focus of a later segment here in this program. So once the governor's office of general counsel has reviewed all the candidates application materials, conducted interviews, considered any judicial evaluations that have been submitted and done uh, further vetting, the governor's legal team makes a recommendation to the governor as to who he should appoint to the vacancy. These days, the governor is not conducting a, a second round of interviews uh, like he's maybe done in the past. Uh, most typically at this stage, the governor will simply call the successful applicant and offer the appointment uh, over the telephone. And then it will be the appointee who will work with the superior court to decide when that appointee's start date will be. So, so in, a, in a real nutshell, that's what the process looks like. And I'm gonna turn it over to Judge Poydras now who can share with you his experience going through this appointment process just what, a couple of months ago, Judge? A little longer than that, but it it feels like it was a couple of months ago. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wanhoff, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be a member of this panel and to have the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, what I'll do is uh, start with a little bit of my background. After law school, I worked as a public defender and then as a deputy prosecutor. Uh, working on both sides was a, a big influence on my decision uh, to pursue uh, becoming a judge. Um, I wanted to be in a position where I could seek justice after considering the merits of both sides without necessarily having the requirement uh, to advocate for one side over the other. Uh, fortunately, uh, soon after uh, this realization, I received an opportunity to serve as a neutral decision maker, uh, first as a hearing examiner for the Department of Licensing, and next as a administrative law judge for the Office of Administrative Hearings. I spent almost nine years working full-time as a neutral decision maker between my time as a hearing examiner and my time as an administrative law judge uh, before I was appointed to King County District Court. Um, and then most recently, as Mr. Wanhoff alluded to, um, in July of 2021, I was uh, able, fortunate to um, interview with Mr. Wanhoff and Catherine Leathers uh, from the governor's office. And ultimately, uh, I spoke with uh, Governor Inslee and had the honor of being appointed by Governor Inslee to King County Superior Court. In sharing a little bit about my experience, um, my intention uh, this afternoon is to do more than just kind of tell you about my experience, but my hope is that um, I will be able to, in my discussion with you, provide three tips or three takeaways uh, for you to consider as you are yourself assessing whether or not a career in the judiciary is something that you would like to pursue. Um, I've had the, the privilege now of serving as a judge or neutral decision maker for, for over 13 years. And I hope to be an example of someone whose dream of becoming a judge uh, came true. Um, the first point that I want you to uh, consider um, is to have hope and to have belief. Um, like me, I suspect uh, that some of you may be the first in your family to go to law school and become an attorney. Um, and by extension, um, some of you are likely the first people in your family to consider the possibility of becoming a judge. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from my time in speaking with you this afternoon, 
is that despite the fact that you may not have a father or mother or uncle or aunt uh, that is a judge or even a family uh, full of lawyers, it is critical that you not only develop, but also maintain the hope and belief uh, that you can achieve your goal of becoming a judge. Even after I became a lawyer and met judges, I obviously knew that people would ultimately become judges, but I often thought that that happened to other people and not people like me or people with my background. And some of you may feel that way right now, um, but like I did, you also have to change your way of thinking and begin to believe that you can achieve your goals. And it's most important uh, that in doing so, uh, you make sure that you do not allow your own self-doubt to talk you out of pursuing your dreams. The second takeaway that I want you to consider is to start your preparation early. While I started with the, the hope and belief um, takeaway, um, it also is important that I make it clear and that you make no mistake about it. It takes work uh, to achieve the goal of becoming a judge. And one thing that I wish to impart upon you is to start your preparation early. Uh, starting today, control the things that you can control right now. Learn all you can uh, with each job that you hold. Get as much experience as you can with different areas of law and work to develop a good reputation in your office with the bench and especially with opposing counsel because they likely will be asked about you when you decide to ultimately apply to become a judge. Also keep records of your trials if you are a litigator because many, if not all ju judicial applications require you to summarize in some detail your previous trial experience. Additionally, seek out mentors, even if they're not judges, because your attorney mentors may know judges and may be able to introduce you. Look for fellowship and educational opportunities geared towards attorneys that want to become judges. For example, the Judicial Institute or the Washington State Bar Association's pro tem training are two examples of those types of educational opportunities. Lastly, leveraging your judicial education opportunities, your mentors, um, use those, those items to seek out pro tem opportunities and to start gaining judicial experience. All of these things work together in preparing you to be ready to seek a judicial position. The third takeaway is once you've made some progress, start and finish the application. Mr. Wanhoff spoke about the governor's application for superior court, and he did not understate the fact that the application is quite lengthy, and it takes a significant amount of time to complete the application, and you want to make sure that you give yourself enough time to complete the application, and then to also ask people that you trust uh, to review it and to provide feedback for you so you can ultimately have a final uh, polished draft of your application to su submit at the appropriate time. Also, <clears throat> for this stage of the process, uh, do not be lulled into sleep thinking that you have more time to complete your application than you actually have. For example, you may start to hear rumors that a particular judge is going to retire at a particular time, or maybe that a judge is going to go to a different court and you may think that you have it till at least then to complete your application, but that can change in a blink of an eye. So be diligent in completing your application because not only will it likely be required for your, the appointing authority, uh, most if not all organizations that offer judicial ratings for state and local positions also require a completed governor's uh, questionnaire as a prerequisite when you're requesting ratings interviews. Further, uh, there are sometimes long list for ratings interviews, so you don't want to have an unfinished application uh, slow you down from preserving your place in line. Um, but as Mr. Wanhoff indicated, you'll hear more details about the ratings process in the next segment. I have an example of my own experience um, <clears throat> as it pertains to 
this uh, takeaway and the need to be prepared early. Um, I received an email from the Washington State Bar Association uh, that I got about the end of the day on a Wednesday announcing that the governor's office was accepting applications for appointment to King County Superior Court. That same email also indicated that the deadline for submitting the application was that upcoming Monday. So in total, I had about five days to submit one of the most significant employment applications I've ever submitted. Fortunately, I had previously finished it and only needed to reach out to mentors to have some additional revisions before my application was in final form. And I'll acknowledge uh, that for King County Superior Court, uh, the circumstances are a little bit unique because Governor Inslee's office is uh, historically um, accepted applications on a, on a bit of a rolling basis. Um, but had the deadline been more firm and had I not been mostly prepared and ready to, ready to apply, there's no way that I would have made the deadline. So with that in mind, um, you never want to um, potentially have an appointment opportunity um, be missed um, because you don't know when it's gonna open up you don't know how long it's going to be open for in terms of the application period, and you don't want rushed or incomplete application materials to be the reason you miss your opportunity uh, to apply. This all goes to show the importance of starting and completing your application uh, so that you're ready to submit it when the time is right. And in addition to that, um, I'm going to uh, throw in one bonus tip for you. Um, you need to have stamina. You need to have patience, additional patience on top of that, and even more patience because this process in seeking out the bench and becoming a judge is a marathon and not a sprint. There likely will be potentially periods where there's flurried activity, but those will also be balanced by long periods of waiting. There also may be some disappointment along the way. If you don't get a position that you apply for the first time, or maybe even a second or subsequent time, but don't give up, keep focused, uh, keep doing your best to control the things that you can control, and more, most importantly, have hope and have belief in yourself. At this time, that will conclude my remarks. I look, remarks, I look forward to answering any questions you may have if time allows at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Poydras and Mr. Wanhoff. We appreciate that. And what a perfect segue uh, presentation. Uh, we're moving into the judicial ratings process. And so you heard a little bit there from, well, Mr. Wanhoff on behalf of the governor's office, how the governor's office uses uh, the results of that ratings process, and from Judge Poitras about uh, how to make sure that you have enough time to go through that process and uh, complete it. And so uh, I'm happy to introduce next Aileen Zhao. She is an attorney. She's been practicing in Washington since 2011, and she has served as a public defender in King County, and she's now working for the Washington Attorney General's Office. And she has served tirelessly for the Joint Asian Judicial Evaluation Committee, of which she is a co-chair. And so now I'd like to turn it over to her to provide some more insight about that process. Thank you for being with us, Ms. Dow. Hi, thank you so much for asking me to join. Um, I've been on the Joint Asian Judicial Evaluation Committee for about six years, and I can say a lot of judges come with very similar life perspectives, and they don't all understand how important it is to have a, di a diversity of people with different life experiences, and that that actually really strengthens courts and uh, enhances the court's ability to actually achieve its mission of providing justice for the whole community that's tended to serve. So I'm really excited that you folks are all here. Um, so the Joint Asian Judicial Evaluation Committee is made up of six different Asian specialty bars, the Asian Bar, the Middle Eastern Bar, the Vietnamese Bar Association, Filipino, 
South Asian Alliance and the Korean Bar Association. So it's six different bar associations. We do our interviews with two other minority organizations, the Latino Latina Bar Association and QLaw. So I can only speak to really JJEC's experience, but um, the three organizations do the interviews in a round robin style. So when you apply, when you request to be interviewed by one of us, uh, you get interviewed by all three of us. Right now, JJEC, our organization is what's called the master scheduler. So that we're the ones who are um, in contact with the candidates and setting that up. Uh, so, uh, to run through the basics, um, so for JJEC, our interviews take place the third Thursday of each month. There are usually four interviews, although more recently we've increased it to five interviews and sometimes six. So that really isn't actually a lot of interviews that happen. And my first advice, like Judge Poydra said, is to, if you're interested in getting a rating from the three organizations to make sure you have your application in early, Right now, we're scheduling folks for February, and I believe in the last two years, I feel like there's been this big um, flurry of lots of openings happening at once, and these interviews all take place via Zoom, which is great for access across the state. It also means that we're getting requests from all over the state, too. Um, so that just goes to show how important it is to try to get them in early. Um, so what JJEC does in general is we provide ratings to the governor. We also provide ratings for the community. We post all of the ratings online so it is public. Um, your JJEC rating can also be something you could use in campaign materials. I'll sometimes see folks we interview will say like, we were exceptionally well qualified by uh, the Joint Asian Judicial Evaluation Association. So that's a way that we can support folks as well. Um, and for the ratings, we don't provide endorsements. The ratings go from not qualified, qualified, well qualified to exceptionally well qualified. And I believe that's sort of the rubric that a lot of the judicial evaluation committees make. Um, I can't remember the website. It's something like WashingtonBallot.com that I've noticed when uh, the judges who are on the panel can speak to this, but um, sometimes they'll post the judge's name and then they'll show all of the rankings that they, or all the ratings that they've gotten from the different organizations side by side with their opponent. Um, so that's another way that the ratings are seen by the community. As far as the mechanics of seeking a rating go, um, like we've talked about, apply early. Um, right now we're into February you get placed, you get actually scheduled a date and time once your application materials are completed. Um, so going back to that governor's application, we at JJEC and um, ELBA and QLA accept the governor's application or the WSBA application or the KCBA application. So there's not an additional one for the three of us. Um, as soon as we receive your materials, then you'll be added onto the list. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that your rating with uh, JJEC at least lasts three years. So while you should certainly apply early, you could potentially apply too early if you anticipate that something significant is going to happen in the next one or two years. Or if you're a little earlier in your legal career, maybe you're at under 10 years, your application might be stronger in one or two years when you've had more trials or if you feel like you or if you haven't had any pro time experience and that's something you want to pursue it's worth waiting to have um that that edge to be able to answer those questions otherwise you might have a rating which three years from two or three years from that point um, doesn't accurately reflect what your strengths are um, as far as the interview process goes with JJEC, um, it's, we do 20 minute interviews, which is very short. So you obviously wanna make sure everything's working. We give candidates the opportunity to make an opening um, and a closing statement if they want. So if there are things that you really want any organization to know, it's worth having kind of your two minute bullet point spiel. So you make sure that um, that information doesn't get lost. Um, you know, as you're doing your questions, since it is such a short amount of time, uh, make sure that you're answering the question that's asked because you don't want to lose those precious minutes. Uh, right after we interview folks, we deliberate, uh, the panel deliberates pretty much immediately after 
we go through reference checks, that process is conducted in the weeks leading up to your interview, and then we issue our rating, which is sent to the governor and posted online. Um, I guess some suggestions. So for JCheck, we issue our ratings based on our bylaws, and I make sure to send those bylaws to every single person who looks for a rating. We don't, um, we don't hide the ball, and I would imagine that the other bar associations don't either. It has pretty, hopefully clearly, what makes someone qualified, what makes them well qualified, what makes them exceptionally well qualified. So in preparation, I would suggest looking at those and writing down for yourself what makes me exceptionally well qualified and how do I hit every single bullet so that you know in your interview answers or your opening or your closing that you can address those things. So we don't have any questions at the end of the day of what a strong candidate you are. Also, this might be kind of obvious, but know your weaknesses and be ready to address them. If, you know, everyone, there's no perfect candidate, but if you know you've only had civil experience or you know you've only had criminal or you know you haven't had pro tem, just be ready to go in with an answer, uh, whatever it may be. So that's, um, yeah, that's pretty much everything for me. And I look forward to any questions that you folks have. Thank you so much. Uh, I did put in the chat, there is a website called votingforjudges.org, and they will often list the different ratings that candidates got during election season. And so you could always check that out now if you wanted to kind of see what that looks like uh, and look at past ratings that have been posted on that site. So, uh, so far we have been talking about the uh, process to become a state court judge. Uh, and now we're going to pivot a little bit and we're going to talk about becoming a federal judge, uh, specifically in the trial court with the district court. So I would like to welcome Sarah Lawson, who is going to introduce um, Ms. Lauren King. Uh, Sarah Lawson is an attorney at Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt and whose her clients include tribal governments and tribal entities. She is an enrolled member of the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. And she has just completed serving as the president of the Northwest Indian Bar Association for the past four years. So Ms. Lawson, to you. Thank you, Judge Rothrock. Um, it is my honor this morning uh, or this afternoon to introduce um, or to give the introduction for my friend, Lauren King. Lauren King is a principal at Foster Garvey PC based in Seattle, Washington, where she's practiced since 2012. She chairs the firm's Native American practice group and has served as a pro tem appellate judge for the Northwest Intertribal Court System since 2013. Ms. King was also an appointed commissioner on the Washington State Gambling Commission and has previously taught federal Indian law at Seattle University School of Law. Prior to joining Foster Garvey, Ms. King was an associate at Burns Keller Cromwell LLP from 2010 to 2012, and at KNL Gates from 2008 to 2009. Lauren graduated from the University of Virginia School of Law in 2008 and from the University of Washington with distinction in 2004. Ms. King was nominated to fill the seat vacated by Judge Robert Lasnik. Her nomination was confirmed by the Senate on October 5th, 2021. Lauren is a citizen of the Muscogee Nation, which is located in Oklahoma. She's the first Native American federal judge to serve in Washington state and just the sixth Native American judge to serve on the federal bench ever. There are currently four judges, four Native American judges serving on the federal bench. Lauren, I will leave it now to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, it's an honor to be here today, and I thank the KCBA for inviting me to speak and share the stage with these other wonderful speakers. I have the list of attendees up on my screen, and I was just curious if people could maybe raise their hands if they um, are interested in becoming a judge or think that they might potentially be interested in becoming a judge. Okay, I'm seeing a fair amount of hands. That's so encouraging, and I'm so glad that we have uh, an audience full of uh, aspiring public servants. I was asked to speak about my path to the bench, and I'm particularly happy that this event is called The Benches for All, because I think that my experience is just one example that this path is open to everyone. Uh, and I like using visuals, so I'm gonna try to share my screen here, and bear with me while I try to do that. Okay. 
Okay, I might have to um, do a different sharing when I try to show a video, but we'll get started here. Okay, actually, uh, let me get out of this. I've been having a little bit of problems with bandwidth, and so now the uh, PowerPoint is taking up my entire screen <laughs> and taking up a little bit of my bandwidth. So I'm going to try one more time here uh, to do a partial screen share, and if that doesn't work, I'll just proceed without. Uh... Nope, that's not going to work. Um, so I'll just proceed without the PowerPoint. Um, Becoming a federal judge is an accomplishment but, uh, beyond any dream I had for myself growing up, including in my early years as an attorney, and I hope that others who aspire to serve the public leave this event feeling empowered to pursue that dream. I know that we have a broad audience ranging from law students to experienced lawyers, and I tried to prepare my remarks without assuming that anyone has particularly deep knowledge about becoming a federal judge. I should also mention that I'm not an expert in this subject. Uh, the path to becoming a federal judge is different depending on court level and depending on the state, and the process has also varied over time. So it's important to know that I'm speaking solely about my own personal experience, and I would encourage any audience member who aspires to be a federal judge to research the process for the particular position you're interested in. Um, this would be where I go to my next slide and give you a general overview. Um, I'm going to talk about my path to the bench in three parts. First, I'll describe some basics about the federal judiciary and becoming a federal judge. Second, I'll talk about my background and what led me to want to be a federal judge. And finally, I'll talk about my experience applying for the position and being nominated and confirmed. And I'll also throw in some trivia questions about the federal bench. And so yet another exper experiment this time, hopefully it works. Let me launch the polling. All right, first trivia question is, how many federal judicial districts, for example, the Western District of Washington, are there in the United States? Is it 151, 94, or 100? All right, get your votes in. I'm going to give three more seconds. Three, two, one. Now I'm going to share results. All right, 59% of you uh, said it was 94, and that is correct. Uh, here in Washington, we have two judicial districts, the Western District of Washington and the Eastern District of Washington. Judicial districts can have more than one courthouse, and in the Western District, we have a courthouse in Seattle and a courthouse in Tacoma. Across the 94 judicial districts, there are over 650 authorized Article III district court judgeships. The 94 judicial districts are organized into 12 regional circuits, each of which has the United States Court of Appeals. In addition, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has jurisdiction to hear appeals in specialized cases. There are currently 179 authorized judgeships in these appellate courts. At the top, we have the United States Supreme Court, of course, with nine seats. Article three of the Constitution provides that judges, quote, hold their office during good behavior. This mean that means that judges have a lifetime appointment unless they're removed through the impeachment process. The lifetime appointment is one way the Constitution protects the independence of the judiciary. The Constitution doesn't actually specify qualifications to become an Article III judge, but the administrative office source uh, that I, I encourage you to look at um, says that, quote, those who are nominated are typically very accomplished private or government attorneys, judges in state courts, magistrate judges, or bankruptcy judges, or law professors. I'm going to keep my remarks on the basics of the federal judiciary brief, uh, but if anybody wants more information, whether basic or detailed, about federal courts and federal judges, I recommend looking at the websites of the United States Courts, the Federal Judicial Center, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and the Congressional Research Service. Next, I'm going to talk about my background, but before I get into that, I have another trivia question. So let me launch this poll. Among the current judges, both active and senior in the Western District of Washington, how many years has the longest serving judge been on the federal bench? Is it 29, 35, or 41 years? All right, get your votes in. Three, two, one. 
All right. Once again, the majority of you have the right answer at 41 years. Uh, Judge Barbara Rothstein was appointed in 1980, and she currently uh, sits by de designation in the uh, District Court for the District of Columbia. At the time she was confirmed, Judge Rothstein was not only the first woman district court judge in the Western District of Washington, she was also the youngest at age 41. The next year, Judge Kuhnauer became the youngest appointed judge in the Western District of Washington when he was appointed at age 40. He too continues to serve the district as a senior judge. Turning to my background, I am quite literally an Okie from Muscogee. I'm originally from Oklahoma and I'm a citizen of the Muscogee Nation. I didn't grow up dreaming of becoming a lawyer or a judge and I didn't have any uh, lawyers in my immediate family. And I also didn't necessarily know where I wanted to end up living in my adult life. I was fortunate to spend my college years in Seattle at the University of Washington where I studied finance and information system at UW's uh, business school. One class that I took at UW actually ended up changing my life, and that was Introduction to Law. I did my final project on the Napster litigation, and I was fascinated by the intersection of law and technology and how lawyers and judges had to apply law to technology that did not exist at the time the law was enacted. Uh, so I decided I wanted to be an intellectual property lawyer. I went to the University of Virginia School of Law, and I served as editor-in-chief of the Virginia Journal of Law and Technology. I thought that when I graduated, I would do transactional work in copyright and trademark at a law firm, and then after a few years at the firm, take an in-house position at one of the many tech companies in Seattle. My first job out of law school was at K&L Gates. I got to do a lot of interesting copyright and trademark work at K&L, but when I first started at the firm in 2008, the country was in an economic recession and the litigation practice group was one of the busiest groups at the firm. I really enjoy the litigation projects I worked on, and that ultimately led me to become a litigator at a boutique called Burns Keller Cromwell. One of the changing points in my career was the first assignment I had at Burns Keller. I took on a pro bono representation of a tribe in a hearing in United States v. Washington, which is a big treaty fishing rights litigation here in the Western District of Washington that had been active for 40 years at that time. 13 tribes were involved in the hearing, and arguing against lawyers who had been involved in the case for decades was a pretty intimidating experience for me uh, as a second year attorney, but I was glad that I took that opportunity to, to test my skills. The next week, another tribe that was involved in the hearing called me and told me they wanted to hire me as their lead outside attorney in the tribe's natural resource matters. I excitedly went to a partner's office and told him about the tribe's request, and he told me that I couldn't accept the engagement because I was just a second year attorney and the firm didn't practice in Indian law. So I went to another partner and he told me that if I wanted to do it, I could. So as a second year attorney, I got my first client and I began a very fulfilling career in Indian law. I have two sides to my story here. First, I'm often asked what term should be used when someone's talking about Native Americans or about Indian law. Generally, I use the term Native American when I'm talking with non-lawyers and Indian when I'm talking to lawyers. This is because Indian is a word that's often used by Native American tribes and members to describe themselves. And it's also a term we use frequently in the law, like when we're talking about the Indian Child Welfare Act or the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. But different people prefer different terms, so I usually recommend asking the particular tribe or tribal member what they prefer to be called. The second aside to my story is that I went on to have a great working relationship and friendship with the partner who told me no, uh, including chairing a 23-day trial with him uh, for this tribe in 2015. In my first year of representing this tribe, I served as its lead attorney in a mediation that lasted several weeks before a magistrate judge in the Western District of Washington. After the mediation was over, the magistrate judge took the time to talk with me about my career, and he encouraged me to consider becoming a federal judge. Of course, I thought he was joking because I knew it took a presidential nomination to become a federal judge and the president of the United States wasn't exactly somebody who was in my social circles or would ever be in my social circles. Over the course of my career, I was fortunate to be able to build a national Indian law practice. As I was building that practice, I decided to move to Foster Pepper, which became Foster Garvey when it merged with Garvey Schubert in 2019. In my nearly 12 years at the firm, I served on its diversity committee, compensation committee, and executive committee. I became partner in 2016, and I've been chair of the Indian Law Practice Group since then. 
A lot of people mistakenly think that Indian law only involves tribes' internal laws, uh, but it actually involves a much broader range of legal issues. In a given week during my job, I could be helping clients with issues related to taxation, employment law, treaty rights, construction law, and intellectual property law. Uh, so it's a practice where you can effectively be a generalist, and I really enjoyed that about it and feel that it gave me a good pre uh, preparation to become a federal judge. Reflecting on my career, there hasn't been a day that's gone by that I haven't felt lucky to be a part of this incredibly collegial and supportive legal community. I've had some incredible mentors in my life, and many of those mentors came from my service to the community over the years. Pro bono projects, service on boards and community committees, and other volunteer work. So I encourage everyone watching this presentation today to think about ways you can serve your community. It's not just a good thing for the people that you serve, it could also change your life. I've talked about how pro bono work resulted in my first client at the beginning of my Indian law career, but that's not the only pro bono work I did that changed my life. In 2013, I volunteered to help the Northwest Intertribal Court System negotiate a contract with the service provider to make tribal court opinions available and searchable online. After I completed my work, the appellate director asked if I would be interested in being a pro tem judge for the intertribal court system. At the time, I was a fifth year attorney and had doubts about becoming a judge so early in my career, but I remembered the words of the encouragement uh, from that magistrate judge a couple years earlier, and I said yes. I served on the Northwest Intertribal Court System for eight years, and I loved the work that I got to do. This finally brings me to December of 2020, when the vacancies for five federal judge positions uh, in the Western District of Washington were posted. I felt like serving as a federal judge would be a marriage of all the things I loved about the different parts of my career. The privilege of serving the public, the excitement of engaging with a broad range of laws and legal issues, and the satisfaction of getting to serve as a neutral and faithfully applying the law to the record before me. I can't say at the time that I applied to be a federal judge that I thought I'd be nominated but I could think of no greater honor than serving the public in this way, so I decided to take the chance and apply. I encourage all of you who aspire to be a public servant to do that same thing, uh, take a chance and at least put your name in the hat. And if your dream is to be a federal judge, I hope my presentation can help by demystifying the process a little bit. And before I get into the process itself, I have a final trivia question. So let me launch the poll. Since 1977, what is the greatest number of days a federal judge nominee has waited to be confirmed following announcement of their nomination? 364 days, 221, or 1,441 days? All right, three, two, one. Once again, you got the correct answer, 1,444 days, or the majority of you got the correct answer. Um, I will stop sharing that poll. Uh, that amount of time is an outlier, uh, and according to a recent Congressional Research Service report, the median number of days between nomination to confirmation has ranged from 133 days uh, to 268 days in recent administrations. The time between my nomination and confirmation was 146 days, so my experience fits within the more recent average time frame. The judicial selection process basically includes four components. Um, I'll first give a basic overview of those components and then I'll get into more detail about each of them. First, there's a presidential nomination and that usually involves the home state senators first recommending potential nominees. Second, the ABA Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary performs its review and rating process. Third, the Senate must give its advice and consent and there are a few components to that. Each nominee must complete a Senate Judiciary Questionnaire, a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and questions for the record following the hearing. If the Senate Judiciary Committee reports a nomination favorably or otherwise allows the nominee to move forward, the nomination is ripe for a full Senate vote. Finally, if the Senate confirms the nominee, the President signs a commission. The first part of the process, uh, the home state senator's recommendation of potential nominees, happens differently in different states. Here in Washington, the senators have established a 10-member nonpartisan judicial selection committee. Uh, so it was not, as I initially thought, something where you had to kind of be in elite social circles. This application is open to everybody and you are reviewed by this nonpartisan committee to start with. 
Uh, for the most recent vacancies, the committee reviewed applications, interviewed candidates, and advised Senators Murray and Cantwell on their findings, including suggesting potent, uh, potential candidates before the senators made their final recommendations to President Biden. After the committee forwarded its suggestions to the senators, the senators and their staff interviewed the candidates. Uh, they then recommended potential nominees to the White House, and the White House Counsel's Office interviewed those individuals. As I've noted, uh, the most recent, actually, if I had my slides up, I would have noted this on my slides. Uh, the most recent application form for the Western District of Washington is still online. So if anyone's curious about the process, uh, you can search for that to get a better idea of what uh, this part of the process involves. Uh, some examples of information that the application asked applicants to provide uh, was similar to what was requested in the Senate Judiciary Questionnaire. So, for example, a description of 10 of the more significant matters the applicant has handled, names and contact information for opposing counsel, attorneys who know the applicant best, and attorneys who have appeared before the applicant if the applicant has served as a judge. Another component of the initial evaluation process, which is emphasized on the application form, is an extensive FBI background check. The application form includes some standard FBI questions at the bottom, and it also encourages applicants to familiarize themselves with the nature of the background check. After the evaluation by the committee, the senators and the White House and the FBI background check were complete, I was informed that I would be nominated as a federal judge. It still feels surreal to say that today, but uh, that was far from the end of the process. The next step was completion of the Senate Judiciary Questionnaire. In addition to some of the questionnaire components that I listed when I was talking about the application, uh, there are other examples of requested information, including uh, every presentation you might have given um, and other comprehensive information about your background, including everywhere you've worked since uh, age 18 uh, that is requested in that document. For me, this process confirmed, as others have said today, that it is good professional hygiene to keep track of this information. Uh, for example, it was very helpful that my firm and I maintained a list of all my speaking engagements over the years to be able to respond um, to that question regarding presentations. We didn't do as good of a job keeping all the presentations in one place, but I ended up being able to find copies of most of the presentations I did over the course of my career. Another component to the judicial selection process is the evaluation by the ABA Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary. For most of its history, the committee completed its evaluation before the president announced the nomination, but from 2001 to 2008 and from 2017 till now, the committee has completed its evaluation after the nomination is announced, but before the nominee's Senate Judiciary uh, Committee hearing. The ABA evaluation of a nominee is usually assigned to a current member of the committee, and this is a 15-member committee from the judicial circuit in which the judicial vacancy exists. Uh, the evaluation does not consider a nominee's political affiliation or ideology, but instead focuses on professional qualifications, integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament. According to the committee's background or document, the central feature of each evaluation is the evaluator's interviews with a, quote, broad cross-section of judges, lawyers, and others to obtain their assessments of the nominee's integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament, and the underlying bases for such opinions. Generally, the evaluator can get contact information for these individuals from the SJQ, but the evaluator may ask for additional contact information or for a list of additional judges or lawyers who know the nominee. After the evaluator completes the interviews with people who know the nominee, the evaluator has an extended interview with the nominee. This is usually in person, but during COVID, some interviews have been conducted in virtual meetings. After the evaluator is done with all of that, the evaluator sends a formal report to each committee member and each committee member provides their vote on what rating to give the nominee. There are three potential ratings. Uh, the highest rating is well-qualified uh, and this information is all available in the background or document. Uh, well-qualified means that the nominee is at the top of the legal profession in his or her legal community has outstanding legal ability, breadth of experience, and the highest reputation for integrity, and demonstrates the capacity for sound judicial temperament. The rating of qualified means that the nominee satisfies the committee's very high standards with respect to integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament, 
and that the committee believes that the nominee is qualified to perform all the duties and responsibilities required of a federal judge. When a nominee is found not qualified, it means that the committee has determined that the nom nominee does not meet the committee's standards with respect to one or more of its evaluation criteria. For example, the committee's taken the position that a nominee should have at least 12 years experience in the practice of law, and in the past, the committee has issued not qualified ratings to nominees with less than 12 years of experience. The rating will be sent uh, to the Senate Judiciary Committee next uh, before your hearing date. Next in the process is that hearing. The Judiciary Committee is currently made up of 22 United States Senators split evenly between Democrats and Republicans. During the hearings, nominees can be asked a broad range of questions about their experience, the law, and other topics. And I'm gonna try to show a short clip from the most recent hearing that I think is an example, a good example of the types of questions that nominees are asked. Once again, trying to work with my share screen here. We'll see how it goes. What do you have to have to have a justiciable case in federal court? Uh, are you referring to standing itself? Or? Yeah, standing, rightness, sure. every element of it. Sure. Uh, uh, well, for standing, uh, under the Lujan Supreme Court's case in Lujan, uh, a claimant has to have an, an injury in fact, a uh, 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 legal injury that is concrete and particularized, uh, as well as uh, some sort of causal connection between the claimed misconduct and, and the injury, and finally, that it's likely to be redressed. And uh, rightness occurs if, if uh, when, when a court decides whether the matter should be heard at a particular time. Uh, and, and there's a related doctrine of mootness, where if something is a hurt that, that would render a, a court's decision to be advisory, uh, or, or whether there's a likely to have a recurrence in, in the case before you. In federal court, when is, uh, when, when is there a subject matter? jurisdiction over a case in federal court? Subject matter jurisdiction would occur, Senator, uh, if it's a question of federal law, whether it's statutory or constitutional, uh, or uh, if it comes up under, under uh, diversity jurisdiction between uh, citizens of different states. Can that ever be waived? I'm sorry? Can that be waived? No, uh, subject matter jurisdiction is a requirement of entering to federal court. Which, uh, under what circumstances should a federal court apply state law? Uh, federal court should apply state law uh, when they're sitting diversity. Uh, and uh, also, if there are ancillary state issues within a federal case, the federal court might, uh, as a discretionary matter, take on those uh, uh, ancillary state issues along with the federal claims that it's considering. What about federal common law? Federal common law, as I understand it, applies uh, in a narrow, uh, not not frequently. Uh, there, there may be federal procedural uh, issues that come up under federal common law, but it's but there's it's very limited. How uh, uh, no, no, you you clerked uh, for a federal judge on the court to which you've now been nominated, Judge Pius. Um, would you identify Judge Pius as one who would be a judicial role model of sorts? I would. Uh, and how would you describe your judicial philosophy? Okay. I think that's a good example of some of the questions that you might be asked. Some other questions that were asked by different senators at that hearing include, when, in your opinion, does life begin? And what role should a judge's personal policy views play in the evaluation of the merits of a case before them? Nominees are also frequently asked questions about positions they've taken as an advocate. I had 28 days between my nomination and the Senate Judiciary hearing, and I was fortunate that my colleagues were able to pick up some of my workload uh, to allow me time to prepare for my hearing. Some of the things that I did to prepare were to watch hearings like this one to familiarize myself with the types of questions that are asked and with how the hearing typically proceeds, and to review the hundreds of pages that I submitted with my SJQ to try to have that fresh in my mind in case I was asked about work that I did several years ago. I also practiced all the questions I could imagine being asked to make sure that my answers would be concise. Uh, for district court judge nominees, each senator gets five minutes for questioning, so I wanted to be respectful of that time limit when giving my answers. The next step in the Senate Judiciary Committee's evaluation of nominees are written questions for the record. 
These are individual questions submitted by various committee members to the nominee that are answered in writing. Uh, some examples from the most recent QFRs that have been posted to the committee website are, is it appropriate for protesters to ignore social distancing mandates and gathering limitations to protest racial injustice? Please describe what you believe to be the, the Supreme Court's holding in Brnovich v. Democratic National Committee. Are there identifiable limits to what government may impose or may require of private institutions, whether it be religious organization like Little Sisters of the Poor or small businesses operated by observant owners? What are those limits? Not every nominee gets the same number of questions. Uh, nominees get about a week to complete their responses and to give you an idea of the volume of work that can be associated with QFRs, the two most recent submissions were 67 and 74 pages long. Again, I was fortunate that colleagues were able to fill in on my matters uh, to allow me to devote my time to completing the QFRs in that week time period. After nominees complete their QFRs, the committee holds a vote. If a majority of the committee votes in favor of the nominee or otherwise allows the nomination to move forward, the nomination is ready for a full Senate vote. Uh, the time to get to that full Senate vote can vary. As I mentioned earlier, the median number of days between nomination to confirmation has ranged from 133 days to 268 days in recent administrations. I spent my time before confirmation transitioning my practice and making sure my files were in order in anticipation of my exit from the firm in the event that I was confirmed. Because confirmation timing is unpredictable, it was a little bit difficult to try to predict how quickly I needed to transition my practice. Uh, but again, I was fortunate to have a lot of support in the process that enabled me to get it done relatively quickly. The last step in the process to become a federal judge is the signing of your commission by the president. Uh, if you search for commissions online, you can see a few examples of what they look like. Uh, once a judge has a signed commission, they're able to take their oath and begin work. I anticipate taking my oath and beginning my work in December. And I can't overstate how excited I am to be joining the bench in the Western District of Washington. This district has an incredibly strong bench and I'm honored beyond words to be part of it. If you take one thing from my presentation today, I hope it is that the federal bench is a path that's open to everyone. If anyone in the audience aspires to be a federal judge, I also highly recommend simply reaching out to some judges you admire to ask for their insight. Judges take their duty as public servants very seriously, and every judge I contacted throughout this process made time out of their bi very busy schedules uh, to talk to me. So I want to extend my thanks again to the King County Bar Association for inviting me to speak and be part of this great panel, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. King, um, and congratulations. So we do now want to open it up. We have some time to answer questions from the audience, and we have all of our guests available. So uh, we would love to have a little more discussion if there's something that uh, you're curious about or something that's, that is on your mind that some of our guests did not address. We would love to have you throw it out. And, um, I'll invite you to do it uh, either if you raise your hand, uh, we will have, uh, we will unmute you so you can go ahead and ask your question out loud. And if you instead would like to chat, uh, type your uh, question into our chat, we'd be happy to read that too. And uh, really, you know, we kind of guessed about what you might like to hear about, but we would love um, to get more specific with anything that's on your mind, so. I'll give a moment for people to raise their hand and ask, uh, ask Beth to uh, unmute anyone, any hands she sees. I thought I have a couple questions. And so maybe I'll, I'll just ask mine and then um, let me know, Beth, if, if there's someone that you're gonna unmute. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, Mr. Wanhoff, a question we uh, are seeing. Ms. King will, uh, has been confirmed and she'll be sworn in and then she will have a lifetime appointment. Uh, and state court judges actually have to run for election. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that and what you might expect a candidate to understand uh, about the uh, election of judges in Washington, if that's if that's part of the process that are uh, something that the governor considers. 
Well, certainly, uh, thanks, thanks for the question. I mean, certainly one's electability, one's ability to keep their seat is one of many factors that is considered. So uh, in the appointment process, we want to make sure that candidates understand that, that the appointment is the first step and they may need to file to retain the seat at the next election cycle. Um, or they, they will need to file to retain the seat. And we, and we hope that they are, they've thought about that and we hope that they're fully invested in in doing what they need to do to, to keep the seat because everything that I've heard from judges is you're not a good judge on day one. It's usually several years into your uh, tenure that you feel confident in your, in your judicial skills. And so we hope that the judges that we appoint plan to stick around and become great judges over time. So certainly one's electability is a factor that, that, that we consider and we hope that they... Um, uh, do what they need to do and uh, to be competitive political candidates. And, and a lot of attorneys aren't necessarily comfortable with the politics of judicial office, but it's certainly something that, that they need to confront at some point if they want to be successful. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a question and I think I'm going to direct this uh, maybe to Judge Poitras if he has any thoughts about it. It says for the state court appointment process, can the panelists talk about how endorsements, such as from elected officials, might come into play and how to go about getting, uh, seeking endorsements? And uh, would you like to address that, Judge Poitras? Sure, I'll do, do my best. And uh, certainly we'll uh, ask uh, Mr. Wanhoff if he has some, some insight on that to, to weigh in as well on, uh, from the uh, governor's office uh, side of things. Um, I, th I think that um, getting support um, is is important uh, to the extent that you're able to um, because it allows uh, the appointing authority uh, to uh, see uh, you from different members in the community. And uh, one of the things that I often heard um, when I was seeking appointment uh, to district court as well as uh, to superior court is that it's more about uh, quality. Uh, rather than, than quantity. And so uh, doing something like a, a mass uh, letter writing campaign uh, may not uh, serve you as well as having some key individuals uh, that um, are able, that are prominent um, within the community, whether that's uh, the legal community or the community at large, uh, that would be willing to, to make a call or, or send a letter or something on, on your behalf um, so that the appointing authority uh, will be able to, to review that in consideration of your other materials. And so I, I certainly uh, see that uh, there, there's potential value in that. Um, how much uh, value the appointing authority uh, may place on that is where I may want to uh, defer to Mr. Wanhoff. Well, I, I, Judge Poitras, you're absolutely correct. It is quality over quantity that is going to make the difference uh, with the endorsements. And I'll, and I'll share a, I'll share a story. Uh, Pierce County had a vacancy a couple years ago, and I think that we received a letter that was signed by something like 17 of the Pierce County judges saying we really hope the governor will strongly consider the appointment of this particular candidate. You know, and when you have that kind of endorsement staring you in the face it's hard to ignore right so i mean certainly having and we we do hear from a lot of the sitting judges for a lot of these appointments we just did a thurston county appointment last month and i think our, or this month and i spoke to almost all of the the judges on the bench there who offered their opinion on the candidate pool and it certainly helps if if i'm hearing in favorable terms the same names over and over again Thank you for that. And I, I guess I would add too, once you are a sitting judge and you're up for election, uh, there's another round of um, gathering support and uh, often judges will go, uh, go visit with certain legislative districts and parties uh, to, to seek endorsements um, from them as well for, for the election to, that is to come. So uh, I also have a question here, and this one is for Ms. King, and it says, um, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering how you have processed your professional shift from one of litigator to one of judge. I think the, the process from nomination to confirmation gives you a fair amount of time 
uh, not only to transition your practice to where you're not being contacted anymore by colleagues or clients, but it also gives you time to meet with judges, to review the code of judicial conduct, and start getting in the mentality of a neutral. Um, I would also mention being eight years um, a tribal court appellate judge uh, helped me shift the mindset from advocate to judge when I served in that appellate role. Thank you. And that's such a great question that will probably be asked of a judicial candidate. How would you approach that shift? So something to think about. Uh, I thought I would ask Ms. Sow a little about going back to the judicial ratings process about what the committee might do kind of behind the scenes. You uh, receive a, a very large application. It's got a lot of information in it. It includes a lot of references, uh, lists of opposing counsel. Uh, what, what does the committee do either before or after the interview to uh, complete its ratings process, if you would please? Sure. So after we schedule you, which usually takes place on the first of the month, then what we do between then and your interview is the um, folks on your panel will read through all your materials. And we have a set of folks who also do the reference checks. So um, if you've appeared in front of someone as a pro tem, usually we try to prioritize those who've actually appeared in front of you as a judge in any capacity. And we also call the opposing counsel. Um, both from the list of your, um, so the governor's questionnaire will ask you to list 10 opposing counsel, and then in your trials, you'll list your most recent trials, um, and for those attorneys that have been your opposing counsel, you'll be putting their phone numbers as well, so we may call folks from both of those lists, and then there's also the list of attorneys that are familiar with your practice, um, so we'll make an effort to call them as well. Um, our, by our bylaws also allow us to take an in input from outside of those references. So from time to time, there might be um, a member from our community or a candidate on their own might even provide additional references or might have additional input on someone. Um, it might even be that a committee member can't make it, but um, they might have some familiar, they might um, let's say it's someone from Grant County, they might personally have a better connection with attorneys from Grant County to collect more information for us if needed. Um, sometimes when we do interviews for folks, we, our reference checkers come up with no one calling them back and that puts us in a really difficult situation. So that's when we would more likely step outside of the, um, outside of the application materials to see if we can get more input from other folks. But for the most part, we usually call the references on your list. Um, does that answer your question, Judge Rothrock? It does, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So if anyone else has a question, I'm gonna give you one last opportunity to throw it out or raise your hand. Uh, one thing I've certainly noticed that everyone spoke to was um, kind of the careful work that you do to craft and gather the information that you need uh, to put your best foot forward and put both in your written materials and then, you know, be prepared ultimately uh, if and when you get, get the interview uh, or at the hearing uh, as Ms. King uh, went through so successfully. Is there anything else that anyone would like to ask any of our guests? I want to thank all of our guests so much. Thank you for being a part of this. And uh, I know that uh, you each provided some insight to different parts of this puzzle that may seem daunting at first, but uh, now that people have some initial information and uh, can start uh, making little steps towards the bigger goal. Uh, we're all here to, uh, to welcome you and wish you well on that journey if you choose to follow that. I know we are all looking forward to uh, Ms. King being sworn in so that we will be calling her judge the next time that we see her. So again, thank you so much to our guests for being present and thank you to everyone who tuned in. Enjoy the rest of your day.